Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McCullen, coming to you on a quiet winter day in the mountains of Utah. My guest this week is game designer and fantasy author James L. Sutter. James is the co-creator of the Pathfinder and Starfinder role-playing games, and was the editor and developer for Paizo Publishing for over a decade, where he oversaw Dungeon Magazine and the Pathfinder Tales novel line. James wrote for the Paizo world, and has published short stories and essays in a number of venues. He's also written comics, tabletop gaming material, video games, and most recently sold a young adult romance. Most importantly, and I think key to his whole essence as a creator, James wrote and recorded the music for this podcast. James and I talk about role-playing games, his love of music, having equity in one's work as a writer, viewing the industry from both the creative and corporate sides, and the way the world has changed since we were kids and how that affects writing modern young adult books. Enjoy my conversation with James L. Sutter. The few times we didn't get any snow days, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. Like, like as a kid, I kept track of that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I ever kept track, but like you would always like, I don't know if this is still how it works, but you would wake up in the morning and, you know, listen to the radio to see if your school was closed. Yeah. You, you, fl- the first thing I do is flip on the radio and listen for the first, they would tell you the temperature because they'd always get around the temp to the temperature before they got around to the school closings. But, but you knew what, what the like threshold was for your school to close. Um, and, uh, you know, ver- like temperature versus wind chill or whatever. And, uh, and I always, I, I always listened and just flipped on the radio and it's so weird. Cause now you just go online, right? I assume. I, I assume, I assume everybody gets like text updates from their school or something, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's weird, you know? I mean, I'm only, God, how old am I? 37, something like that. Um, And I've started writing young adult recently and realized that so much has changed in, you know, the not very long since I was in school. Um, And I worry a little bit about what artifacts of that sort of thing are going to come around and be like, oh, oh, yeah, nobody does that anymore. Yeah, I I'm actually really fascinated by that. And I I'm I'm glad you mentioned the YA angle, because that is it does make kind of our childhood experiences in a lot of ways uh, just completely, you know, like they don't matter anymore. They're not a thing anymore. You know, people that grew up in the 90s had just such a different experience just being a child. Yeah. Well, and I feel like it's almost kind of cliche. Like you can see uh, sort of the generations of like TV and movie writers and probably in fiction as well, but you can see the various breaks where people uh, from like the newer generations are coming up because you don't have, you know, for instance, there are so many movies that especially scary movies that rely on not having cell phones. Yeah. And you can see the older generation of writers, you know, desperately trying to find ways to make all the cell phones not work. Um, and I think it's gonna be really interesting as we get a newer crop of writers who never, you know, they never ex- had that experience of not having access to phones and the internet, etc. And I think we're gonna get a whole different uh, sort of breed of, of plots as a result of people growing up as digital natives rather than trying desperately to work, work around it and shove, shove the films back into the box that we were all comfortable with. Yeah. Well, and because a lot of fiction kind of depends on the trope of not being able to communicate yeah. uh, in some way. And now you've got text, you've got social media, you have a billion ways to reach your friends, like at the tips of your fingers. And, you know, when I, uh, when I was a kid, it was like, and, and the thing is, is I say that and it sounds so very old, but when I was a kid, not that long ago, <laughs> It was like, you know, if if you were doing a camp out, like for Boy Scouts, if you were doing a camp out and people weren't showing up, you kind of assumed they either canceled or died. And you're like, well, I don't have access to a phone. Like, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I guess if nobody shows up, they will hear if they're alive in the morning. Right. And there was sort of no way to know anything, it felt like. I mean, I... Uh when I first started dating my wife, um, she didn't have a cell phone, you know, didn't have a car, didn't have, you know, the only way to get in touch with her was to call the, like the group phone that she shared and wait for her to check the voicemail like a few days later or the, you know, that probably it was a, 
answering machine at that point. Yeah. And that was <laughs> that wasn't exactly a requirement of uh, of us dating, but there was pretty early on. It was like. I would like some way to get a hold of you that takes less than three days, please. Yeah. And there's, I can think of friends that I kind of lost contact with, you know, in my mid to early teens, especially that I just lost contact with them because it was such a hassle to try to get a hold of them on a landline. And like, you know, their grandma would answer the phone and be super furious that some boy was calling them, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And it's just, it's so bizarre because you now can just text somebody well, and, and everybody has a cell phone. And of course we lived in that brief window where like, if somebody was on the internet, then nobody could get through on the phone because you only had the one phone line that you had to plug your modem into. Yeah. And, uh, Oh man, this is totally the episode of <laughs> Brian and James are really old. We're not, <laughs> we're not actually that old. Right. And it's so weird being in your mid thirties and realizing how much the world has changed just in the short time since you kind of graduated high school or college. Yeah. Well, and also to think that we're sort of, I mean, we're in a weird position, right? Because the boomers still by and large hold all the power in society and yeah. they have sort of this whole time. And so we're in this I don't want to say prolonged adolescence because we're in our thirties. Like we should be (laughs) responsible for ourselves, but at the same time, you know, there is a lot of this feeling like we haven't quite assumed the role in society that our, our parents had by the time they were our age. Yeah. Like there was this, you know, when our, when we were kids, it, it felt like our parents were always, uh, you know, like they were, they had a place like, right. Like this, this place in society where they, they were expected to have children and good jobs and And own a house. Yeah. um, Community leaders, church leaders, you know, all these kind of, they were working towards this point that they would probably be at by the mid, their mid thirties. Well, and we didn't exactly have a lot of presidents who were 35, but right. That was sort of the, the limit, right? Like if you hit your mid thirties, you could theoretically be president. And can you even imagine having a president that was anywhere near (laughs) that age, right? Like that would be so wonderful. Right. It's, it's, and it's bizarre. It is bizarre that I could legally like be president or have a president be my age. And it's, it's a very strange kind of concept to look at. And it does kind of affect writing and the way we think about things, especially that are set in the real world. Uh, Because, you know, I can, I can get away with just about anything because I write secondary world fiction. But like you, you, the book that you just sold is, you know, it's it's contemporary. It's it's happening right here. Yeah. Contemporary young adult romance set in Seattle. So it's very much, uh, you know, pertinent to my my own experience. But yeah, it was a it was really strange, um, but in a good way to write it after, you know, I've spent my whole career working in you know, gaming with, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and stuff like that, and then adult science fiction and fantasy. And so to turn and go into a totally new direction was a little bit terrifying, but also really refreshing. Well, and I'd imagine I I was kind of curious about it because it is, if you look at your resume, it's such an incredible left turn Yeah, um, to go into contemporary romance from, you know, because I, I didn't realize that you started with uh, Paizo in when you were 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started at Paizo before I could drink. I, uh, I graduated. Um, I did a thing called Running Start, uh, where you can essentially get two years of college for free during high school. So after sophomore year of high school, I just never went back. But so that meant that I graduated with my bachelor's when I was 20. Um, And, you know, I came out thinking I was going to do journalism and quickly realized that journalism in college is a lot more fun than journalism in the real world. It's like, (laughs) oh, nobody wants to pay me to go like have adventures and write about, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Like the the local suburban newspapers were not big on gonzo journalism. And so (laughs) I needed to find something else. And uh, yeah, it turns out that um, at the time, Dungeon and Dragon magazine were being run out of the suburb uh, right outside of Seattle where I lived. And so I applied and, you know, worked my way up. My first job was uh, sourcing images for their web store at uh, Nicola JPEG. So it really was the uh, the most grunt labor possible. But yeah, then I worked my way up until I was doing magazine stuff. And then we created Pathfinder and it just kind of kept you know, uh, snowballing upward and upward until I was, uh, the creative director on uh, the Starfinder game and like running the novel line. 
did that for about 13 years. Well, and that's crazy. It's funny. So the novel line is funny because that's actually how you and I met, if I remember correctly, is that you approached, approached me at a, at a little publishing party and asked if I wanted to do one of the books. Oh, that's probably, <laughs> that's probably true. I was, uh, I was hitting up a lot of authors at that time because I was, uh, so I was editing this line and, you know, I, I really had a chip on my shoulder because people think that tie in fiction, like, you know, everybody grows up reading Dragonlance or Star Wars or whatever, these sort of branded titles. And then you get a little bit older and everybody gets really snooty about it and is like, oh, well, I would never read, you know, this corporate fiction. And so running one of those lines, I was really dedicated to trying to get the best authors I could find, not just sort of like, and I don't want to be disparaging, but sort of um, there is an appeal to the workhorse authors that come cheap, they get stuff done. You know, I, I get it. Um, but I really wanted to try and bring in a lot of people who weren't already doing that job, you know, going out into the broader science fiction and fantasy world and pulling people in. Um, and it was great because it turns out a lot of the people who are writing science fiction and fantasy of their own also are playing Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and stuff like that. And so I was able to bring in a lot of really great voices to that line, um, which, God, we went for maybe four years, something like that. And so I got to meet a lot of cool people. That was really my foray into the science fiction and fantasy world. Cause before that I'd really been in gaming. Yeah. That, well, that, and that's really interesting. Cause I wanted to kind of ask you, I want to dig into a little bit about kind of your perspective going from, uh, from, from being kind of the creative director slash editor like that is, it feels like a very different job to me than actually writing. Yeah. And, and you and I have talked privately about how much you've always wanted to write and you have done a ton of writing over the years. And, and I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on, on the kind of the dichotomy between those two positions and how you kind of handle jumping between them. Well, you know, I think the hardest thing when I, so I left Paizo four years ago now, um, to write full time. Um, with a real focus on trying to do novels, you know, I've still done, you know, some game work and some video game stuff. And, you know, I, I like to dabble in a lot of different directions, but I really wanted to focus on writing creator own novels. And the hardest thing was that I'd spent, you know, 13 years working my way up into a position as, you know, one of the figureheads of this brand, um, of a couple of brands. And, you know, that comes with a certain level of you know, fame and fun, you know, you get to go to Gen Con and be a rock star. And I knew that if I walked away from the brands, I would kind of be starting over. And so I had to really sit there and say, like, am I comfortable with the fact that like this might be the most successful I ever am right at this moment? Like it might all be downhill from here. And that was really hard. But ultimately, I kind of had gotten to a place where I'd done everything I wanted to do with gaming. You know, and it was one of those things where, you know, I'd talk with my friends and say, if I've written on, I mean, I've worked on literally thousands of game products at this point. I've written, you know, hundreds probably or dozens. And what's one more going to add to my sort of, you know, both my resume and just my life experience? Um, and if ultimately what I want to do is own my own work, I need to start, you know, stop paving the runway and start taking off <laughs> because I think people don't realize that when you work for a brand, like whether you're working for any game company or, you know, whether it's Paizo or Wizards of the Coast or whoever, like you don't own your work. Um, you know, it's all work for hire. So you can spend all this time building something. But at the end of the day, it's not yours. Like, and if you don't get permission to keep going, you have to just walk away, right? Like I I wrote two novels tied into the Pathfinder world, um, Death's Heretic and the Redemption Engine. And I really enjoyed both of them and the audience liked them. And I had a third one planned, but the novel line ended and there's nothing I can do with those characters, right? And so at some point I just got tired of working for somebody else. You know, I, I don't mind being in a, like in a corporate environment, but I didn't like not having equity. You know, I, if we have a smash hit, I want part of that to be mine, you know, and it just wasn't. So ultimately I had to go and, you know, it's been <laughs> at the time I was filled with hubris, you know, cause I was like, yeah, I'm doing great. And I've got all these friends in the science fiction and fantasy world. Like, I had an agent, I had a novel that was, you know, starting to get shopped. And I was like, okay, I'm set. Like, this is, 
this is the point. So I had been the creative director on the Starfinder role playing game and that launched at Gen Con and was this huge success. And, you know, I felt like I like I said, like a rock star, you know, walking down the line, signing autographs and stuff. And I said, OK, this is the high point. I'm going to go out on the high point. And so I came back from that launch. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I said, I quit. I'm out. And everybody thought I was bananas because here I just had this big success. But I knew it wasn't going to get better than that. And and like I said, I was full of hubris. And then uh, people who look at my website will notice I have not sold a novel between when I quit <laughs> then and uh, a couple of weeks ago when we announced the deal. I went through a couple agents. I went through a couple novels that didn't sell. And it was really humbling to remember that, you know, careers don't always go up. Well, and it's it's interesting because we we can talk a lot about kind of the creative industry and how knowing the right people can often often give you a really good leg up. And but it also isn't everything. You know, it's you've got to there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of, you know, hitting the right book at the right time for the right agent. Um, You know, there's there's so much going on in terms of selling something. You know, I I often tell people uh, when asked about kind of, you know, what are the advantages? Oh, can I can I name drop you in my query letter? You know, can I say that I'm a fan of you and stuff like that? Um, or, or if people know me personally, you know, they might say, Hey, can I, can I say that we're friends, you know, things like that. And honestly, it's those kind of things. They get you to the top of the slush pile. And that's about as far as I think they get you. Right. Well, and that's, that's totally the case. You know, I have, (laughs) I have a lot of, uh, editor and agent friends that, you know, we're great friends and they didn't sign me. Right. Um, and, you know, you can definitely the connections are important. Mm-hmm. It's good to have a good reputation. It makes people be a little more inclined, I think, to read toward yes instead of reading toward no. Yeah. But ultimately, they have to connect with the work. And it's not in a weird way. It's like not personal um, because they're, you know, their butts on the line, too. Right. Like they can't buy a book that they don't really believe in or sign an author that they don't really think is going to make them some money. Right. Because that's their job. But, you know, uh, I feel like it was actually really good for me because I'd been a little bit of a I was a very precocious child, as I think probably most of the people listening to this podcast were. (laughs) And so, you know, I did a lot of things early. Right. You know, I got that job in the game industry, you know, when I was 20, 21, which a lot of people would say, like, oh, that's a dream that you work toward. And I got there really early and got to do a lot of really cool stuff. But you know, uh, I didn't, <laughs> I don't really know how to, uh, how to follow that up, except that, you know, sometimes you need to be knocked down a peg. Right. Uh, and so I feel like looking back the novels that I was trying to sell, uh, when I first quit Paizo, I'm glad they didn't come out, you know, they, they weren't ready. Uh, but now I feel like I've really gotten to a place where I'm comfortable in my writing. And I think, you know, writing this, this YA novel was really sort of came out of the realization that like you can be as strategic as you want and write what you think people want and it doesn't matter. So you just got to write the thing that speaks to you, even if it seems like a bad idea. Right. And it was a bad idea in as much as I showed it to my agent and she was like, I don't, I don't do this. Right. Like I don't do young adult romance. So I had to go spend half a year finding another agent before I could even shop it. Yeah. And did you feel like, cause, cause when you started, branching out on your own when you try to when you started you launched this idea of of i'm gonna be my own author um you had tons of experience in creative directing in writing for comics and for ip when i had two novels right like do do you feel like do you feel like jumping into your own owned universe uh you know in a unique universe was it just that much of a shock to you that you you just kind of it took you some time to get your legs under you i think i was just trying to do i have a here's my problem is i'm really a daily taunt every time i read something or listen to a song that is really good i get inspired and i go oh i want to do that so i'm constantly bouncing between genres between styles all these things and you know, in some ways, that's really fun. It keeps things really fresh. But at the same time, uh, it means that I'm not always bringing the skill set that I've been working on to bear, you know, um, like, for instance, my, my, uh, 
my adult science fiction and fantasy agent, I had told her at some point like, oh, you know, I teach classes on world building and, you know, because setting design is what I've done for my whole career as, you know, designing these campaign settings and adventures and stuff. And she went, oh, well, that's weird. I don't think of you as a setting guy at all. And it's because the books that I'd written for her was me getting really excited about trying to do character or trying to do plot and realizing that I had totally neglected the thing that I was actually good at and experienced with. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and I think that can happen to any kind of creative is when they when they do want to try something a little different, they will often overcompensate in an opposite direction of what they are known for or or very good at. And, uh, and I, I don't think that's uncommon at all. Yeah. Well, and that's why I really like, I like to bounce between projects. You know, my, my dream, which I'm attempting to pursue now, um, and I'm at least I'm halfway there <laughs> is to write like young adult contemporary romance, and then also write adult science fiction and fantasy, you know, these two totally separate things so that I can give my brain a break on one when I work on the other. You know, that's why the whole reason I wrote this young adult romance is because I was working on a big dystopian, like science fantasy horror thing during the pandemic. And I just it was not going well. It was very depressing to be working on that. And I started, I was just reading a ton of young adult because it's just, it's much more uplifting. I feel like not that you can't have a uh, very light science fiction. You know, I love Becky Chambers and stuff. That's just people being generally nice to each other. But I feel like young adult had this, uh, this spark that I felt like I was missing in a lot of what I was reading because, you know, you didn't have in young adult contemporary, there's no setting. There's like usually not much of a plot in terms of like the stakes are, will these characters get together or not? And so it all has to be voice. It all has to be voice and just making you feel the fun of being with these characters. And it was just a bright spot during the pandemic. And so I dropped everything that I was doing and wrote this book and didn't even tell my agent about it until it was done. Cause I was like, I know this is, the wrong move strategically in every way, but it's what I got to write right now. Um, and fortunately it sold. So I'm justified in <laughs> retrospect. Right. It worked out, which is always good. Yeah. But I mean, it easily could not have, right. Um, you know, and I had, I had a terrible time, you know, finding an agent who was interested in representing me, especially because I was trying to keep my adult science fiction agent as well as, you know, to handle that half of my career and find somebody else to handle the young adults. And uh, it's interesting. Agents are really big on monogamy. Like a lot of folks just weren't interested in sharing clients, which is weird because they have a whole bunch of clients. So it's like, oh, right. OK, so I'm I'm only with you, but you get to be with everybody. Hmm. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, but fortunately it all worked out. And after seven months of, uh, of trial and, uh, trial by fire, I actually ended up with like my top choice agent. So it was really fortuitous. And then the book sold in like three weeks. So it's been this long period of slogging followed by sudden success. Yeah. Which, which is kind of a, a reasonably, uh, reasonably common story, you know, in kind of right. the field that we work in. Now, how long were you searching for an agent and shopping around? Um, cause was Promise of Blood your first novel? Promise of Blood was my, uh, 2.5 is what I call okay. it. Uh, I had one full length epic fantasy and then I wrote half of a, a, um, historic fantasy that uh, I kind of wrote an entire historic fantasy, but it was really short. It was like 60,000 words, really short for what I wanted to do. Uh, and so I don't really count it as a full book. Um, and then, so Promise of Blood was, I guess, my third. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I've told this story before on the podcast, and it always makes me feel like a bit of a wanker. I got an agent. I got two offers of representation in like a week and a half. Wow. It was really stupidly quick. Uh, and I was, and it was off of the first draft of promise of blood. Uh, wow. And honestly, and that first draft doesn't exist anymore. It's a very different book uh, because both my agent and then my editor made me rewrite most of the book. Um, but I was very fortunate in that both of them saw tons of potential in what I was doing yeah. uh, and wanted to work with me. So, well, and I had a very weird experience also in that my first and second novels were death's heretic and the redemption engine. So I sold both my first and second books you know, fairly little revision. I was not, of course, I was not the editor of my own novels, right? There was somebody else in charge. But uh, but yeah, so I had two novels that had come out and, you know, gotten nominated for some awards and done pretty well. And then 
books three, four, and uh, a novella just totally failed to sell. So I had all of that like standard growing pains coming after two successful novels, which was sort of, you know, it makes sense, but it was a very uh, disconcerting experience. Well, and and I've talked with uh, several authors on this podcast about kind of all of us are plagued by the worry that our next book is going to flop. You know, even the re- even the authors that you think of as really big authors that are you yeah. know, bestsellers and they've made millions, all of us are constantly got that little voice in the back of our head of, okay, next book, next world, whatever. What if it just resonates with no one? Yeah, you, you think once the door is open, it's open. And that's not the case. Like you have to climb that mountain every time. And like, Certainly, there are some people that's not true. Like, I'm pretty sure that uh, Neil Gaiman can mail his publisher a post-it note and they'll be like, OK, great, here's the deal. Um, right. But I think the folks who have that sort of cultural cachet are few and far between. And I, you know, I shopped around also during that period. Um, I shopped around a proposal that I had co-written with a New York Times bestseller who had sold a bajillion D copies and we couldn't get anybody to to pick it up. Right. So there's not nothing is as certain as you think it is. Yeah. And it's, you know, I kind of experienced that with a little bit with my my little urban fantasy, right. which I'm still trying to kind of uh, find time to do the third one of uh, because I wrote it and it was only 45,000 words, but I thought it was a fantastic pitch. And I um, and my agent really, really quite loved it as well. Um, but are the answers we got back from everybody sent, we sent it to were basically like, I looked at it cause it was Brian because he's done really <laughs> well with powder mage, but Ouch. nobody's buying novellas, uh, and nobody is buying urban fantasy right now. And I was just blown off. And, and I think, and, and I, so my agent and I kind of talked about it a bit and, and she just, she's been very cool with me with my self publishing experiments. And she kind of came back and said, yeah, just self publish it. Do what do what you do, and we'll see if it does anything. And I mean, like I'll be honest, like that book, like the first book, has probably made me forty or fifty grand now. Wow! And it's kind of insane to think, okay, nobody was interested in even giving it like a tiny release, and I was able to make that much from this little book. I don't understand why novellas are not bigger business. I mean, I feel like it's basically tour.com and, you know, a little bit of like subterranean press and a few other places, but it really seems like they're thick enough that you can charge, you know, a decent price point for them. Yeah. Uh, You know, you can, they've got a spine, you can put them in bookstores. If anything, it's probably more profit uh, for everyone involved given the amount of work. And yet, people have this idea that they don't sell, which I think is demonstrably untrue. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe they just don't know how to market them correctly. Right. And and I feel like we would have to have this conversation with, you know, who's ever in charge at tour.com. Yeah, that that's the kind of conversation we'd have to have because I am curious myself and I could, I could see a couple of variables that, you know, maybe it's just, maybe it only sells, because of a person's name yeah you know like i kind of feel like my self-publishing uncanny collateral the money i've made from it has only been kind of making it from myself right yeah from the fans that already exist but i have no way of proving that that's just a kind of a gut feeling that i have yeah i mean i think there is something to be said for that and it does seem like in general when the bigger publishers are doing novellas it's okay we've got this guy's or this woman's novel series let's put out some novellas as well and sort of capture that existing audience but i just wonder it seems strange to me that they wouldn't do well given that you know what percentage of novels are bought online you know so if somebody's going to amazon to pick up the kindle version of a book how many of them are really scrolling down to the page count and going Oh, 160, you know, digital pages. That's too short. I won't buy this. Yeah. I just don't think it's happening. I think that people read something and they go, oh, you know, it's Murderbot or something. I've heard this is really great. I'm going to pick it up. I don't know that they care, uh, at least that most of them care. Now, I mean, as a child, I cared deeply. Like I can remember being a kid and, you know, buying books based on how many pages per dollar can I get? 
because I need like that was my entertainment budget, right? I wanted to make sure that it stretched and you know, I was going to buy the fattest book I could find. You know, something like The Stand for $7 is like, "Oh, that's a hell of a deal." <laughs> but yeah, I just don't know how much that is still influencing people. Yeah, and and I don't either, especially with ebooks, like you were saying. It it kind of changes the way you look at things because you don't see the thickness of a book when you're buying yeah. it. Yeah. And I could definitely see like plenty of uh, kind of, oh, well, I, I this book was too short. But that feels like a good review to me. Mm. If this book was engaging me and I loved it, but it turned out to only be 150 pages, like, oh, well, then they want a sequel. Yeah, yeah, do the whole novella series thing. That seems like a win for everybody. I also think there's something really satisfying about the novella length as a reader because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else, but I go through periods where it's really hard for me to find time to read. And so to be able to feel like, ah, yes, I sat down and I finished a book is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And I still get it if I finish a book that's 100 pages versus a book that's 1000 pages, right? And so at a very visceral level, like something like, you know, uh, Django Wexler's like hard reboot, you know, that I can read in a day versus a Brandon Sanderson tome that I'm going to be carrying around for a month. Like there is actually an appeal there because I get to feel like I check off another read a book, you know, mark on my list. Right. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Page Break listeners, Brian here, rudely interrupting myself for a bit of a plug. Making a podcast isn't free, and I'm hoping that you enjoy it enough to pitch in a pittance. To do so, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak, where you can toss as little as $3 a month into the tip jar, $5 a month to get the podcast ad-free and early, and $10 a month to hear your name in the credits and feel a smug sense of superiority. You can also buy my books from your favorite retailer or direct from my website. Thanks to everyone who contributes. Now back to me. Now, I was curious, because you have so much experience in kind of the editorial and the game design and things like that, I was very curious, do you do you enjoy kind of the project manager role, the creative project manager role, um, or is that something that you kind of did just to reach the creative part? Oh, no, no, I loved it, actually. I, <laughs> my, I frequently complain about, you know, uh, writing novels has been my dream since I was a little kid. Um, you know, I was like everybody else sitting there in front of like my parents' old typewriter, you know, at five or six trying to write stuff. So that's always what brings me the greatest sense of satisfaction. But in terms of the day-to-day -day work, I loved being on a team. I love being in a writer's room. I love being a creative director or an editor. Um, I like working with people. I think it's much easier for me to to spend my day, you know, putting out fires and solving interpersonal conflicts and, you know, trying to draw the best ideas out of everybody and blend them together. That's so much easier than just sitting down and like trying to force myself to write. Um, and, you know, I there's some of our, uh, you know, some of our friends, like, for instance, um, Charlie Holmberg, friend of both of ours, she writes like a dozen books a year. And like, that's her happy place is when she's writing. I'm totally not like that. Like I have those moments, but most of the time writing is like going to the gym for me. Like I really am glad that I did it, but it's not, <laughs> it's not easy and it's only sort of fun, um, <laughs> but it's satisfying, right? You know, I think that's why I always get mad when I hear the advice where it's like, oh, you have to love writing. You know, you have to not be able to not write, you know, um, and I think that's dumb. I feel like most of the professional authors I know are very capable of going and playing video games or going on vacation or doing whatever and like would be happy to do that a lot more than they do. Right. Because writing is hard. I actually feel like uh so I used to be a, you know, I don't know if you want to call it semi pro or whatever, but I used to play in a lot of bands. And writing music for me is much more that area where I get into the flow state and, you know, 12 hours have gone by and I haven't eaten, like that sort of thing. Um, writing is much more a, you know, I put in the time and do the work and I enjoy it, but it's it's probably the hardest of the things that I do. Um, so, yeah, I frequently miss working on a team, but ultimately it was necessary to go solo to get the stuff that I wanted. Yeah, I, I, I'm I totally with you on that. You know, I, I've talked about it a little bit before, but, you know, if, if my next series made me $20 million, um, you probably would never hear from me again. <laughs> right. You know, like, 
Like it would just, it, I mean, I say that glibly, I probably would still write occasionally, but it, it would be very much, I, all of my hobbies, all of the travel I'd ever want to do, I would disappear for most of the time. Yeah. You'd go full George Martin. Right. Like <laughs> I would just, I, I can't even imagine, I guess, I guess writing is one of those things that I, I do love it. And I do get into those, those head spaces where it's, it's the most fulfilling thing in my life for a few hours. Yes. But it, it's not something that I'm incredibly driven to do. Um, it's something that I noticed earlier that I'm pretty good at. And I didn't have any other choices for a career. Yeah. Well, and like for me, I like I'm not writing for the money. I'm writing for the ego. Like there's so many, <laughs> so many better ways to make money, um, including like I had a really fun job in a very creative industry. And I mean, of course, it's not always fun when you reach like sort of management levels and you have to <sighs> being in a company means ultimately abiding by the the whims of whoever's above you in that company and so that can mean you know a friend of mine once said they wanted to work for themselves because they were tired of apologizing for other people's mistakes and like bad choices and i think there's there's a lot to be said for that but uh but yeah i don't know i'm i'm writing i think if i never you know if i had 20 million dollars like you say like i would absolutely still write books but i'm very cognizant of the fact that like I'm writing books because I like being an author. Like I like to have an effect on people. I like to entertain. I like to be able to chum around with you and the other authors and be like, hello, I'm in this club. And, and I think that, you know, that sounds kind of bad to be like, oh, you're just making art for the sake of ego. But I think it's more honest than, you know, a lot of people like I'm not, I don't expect my books to change the world. Like it's really nice when I hear that it, something I worked on made a difference to somebody. But ultimately, like, I'm very content with the fact that 10 years after I'm dead, nobody's going to care. Like, maybe people will be reading my books. Maybe they won't. But it won't matter because I'll be dead. Right. You know, I'm, there, there are plenty of other things that I do to try and, like, have a lasting impact on the world. And the writing is really just for me. Like, it's the fun way to build a life and uh, and get to get to do that cool nerd fame thing, right? That we all have where it's like, we're not really famous, but like somebody might, you know, know who we are and that's fun. Well, and the nerd fame thing is interesting because we, um, they will, uh, the, I, they will rena- remain nameless, but there are a number of authors who became famous because they were authors and then got into Twitch and YouTube and became famous for that instead and just stopped writing. And, right. and it's, uh, and it's interesting because uh, I find that incredibly annoying as a professional, <laughs> uh, but I also, there is part of me that understands the ego part of it. Is it, is it jealousy? Is it annoyance or is it jealousy? Uh, no, I, it's probably, there's probably a tinge of jealousy, but there is genuine professional annoyance of, yeah, you finish what you started kind of thing. Well, oh, that for sure. Like you gotta, you gotta follow through on the contracts you make, um, both with publishers and with people. But, but in terms of kind of that jealousy thing, uh, in terms of kind of the nerd fame, there is an ego th- part where I understand. It's like, okay, they they found a better way to sate that nerd ego, um, and and then leaned into it. And I, I can. I can sympathize with that. Yeah. Well, that's like our friend, Dan Wells. I was uh, driving him around at a convention one time and he, he'd you know been doing the con circuit and was just kind of sighing and was like, I just want to get famous enough that I don't have to do conventions anymore and can just write books. And I was like, man, I want to get famous enough that I don't have to write books and can just go to conventions. <laughs> right. Like the, the only thing better than being famous for your art is, uh, being famous for no particular reason, except that you're you like, right. Yeah, I am going to be honest. Like that seems appealing to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of there with you. You like that. That does sound very nice. Like, you know, it would probably be, yeah, it's a, it's a very different thing though. And I think that that's interesting that you brought up Dan because every single person, every creative person has different goals. They have different things that they want out of this career and and that they see for themselves in the future. Yeah. And I think f- the thing is, for me, writing comes out of uh, the same place that music comes from. Right. Um, so I didn't like I actually I wrote my first novel when I was uh, like 25 and I only wrote it because 
uh, the band that I'd been devoting all my time to broke up. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so for me, like music and writing come from this same well. And that well is all about art as entertainment and entertainment requires an audience. You know, when I, I know people who are great writers where they they'll write something and say, it's just for me or like my wife, uh, you know, when she paints, she doesn't care if anybody sees it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she's just making it to make it. And I feel like for me, the audience interacting with a piece is the vital part. Like that's the breath of life into that golem at the end that actually makes it a thing. Um, before then, it's all just prep work. Yeah. And so until somebody's heard that song or read that book, you know, until I've gotten to be on stage and and perform it doesn't feel like it's real. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I'm, I'm, you've brought up your music a couple of times and, <laughs> and I feel like we should stop and showcase that because you did the music for this podcast. Indeed. Indeed. Um, and, and it was, it was really funny because honestly you doing that was one of you offering to do it was one of the things that made me finally pull the trigger on the podcast. Cause it was, it was one of there's when you're, when you're trying to design something like this podcast, there's all these little fiddly bits that you don't really have any professional knowledge of yeah. um, for me. And it, it was editing or the music, you know, intros, you know, things like that. And it's so incredibly uh, intimidating to somebody who has no experience that it's just like, Oh, well I better just not touch it at all. And then you offered to do that. Cause I was musing in our chat room about the whole thing. And, and it really did. It kind of, uh, when, when you did it, uh, it was funny cause you, you kind of, you made the offer and I said, oh yeah, that would be amazing if you're willing to put in a little bit of time and show me what you got. And then you sent, and, and I'll be totally honest. I had no idea what to expect. And then you sent it <laughs> yeah, to me that's and I'm always like, dangerous, right? <laughs> right. It is dangerous. Uh, well, especially with a pre-existing friend, because there's like this collaborative things like, oh, what if I hate it? Like, then I just can't do the podcast because I'll have to pretend that it wasn't their fault. Right. Right. Well, and I sent it to you like three hours later too. Yeah. Like it was, not, it was not very long, but, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Cause I, um, yeah, that really was, it kind of propelled me forward on that and it was very good and it's really cool. And I, oh, thank you. I kind of was curious about this weird kind of gap between the two creative outlets you've been talking about because music is, uh, it's very short form for one thing, uh, at least to the the end user, right? <laughs> I played in a prog band for many years. So short form, uh, it can become long form. <laughs> <pretty easily. laughs> but like it, it, like a song to me, yeah. when you say a song to me, that's like, oh, five minutes max, right? And, you know, an album is going to have what, I don't know, 12 or 18 songs right. or something on it. So that to me, that feels very short form. And, uh, but also there's a complexity to music that it's like a different language that you have to know and understand and be able to kind of gel with. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you feel like those are kind of two different brains that you have almost, or if it comes from the same place. Man, I, I think it probably comes from the same place. Um, but the processes are pretty different, but you know, I think I end up when I write music, it's a very like iterative layered process. Right. And that's the thing that I love about it. Like the initial spark. And I guess this is true of writing as well, but like often the initial spark that gets something down on that canvas or that blank, you know, sound file is really the hard part. And the fun part is just going back over it again and again and being like, oh, well, what if I add a guitar solo here? And what about some horns? And what about a synth? You know, and I think that probably that speaks to my editing background as well. Um, right. Cause I really like learned how to write novels through editing other people's novels. Right. That was mm-hmm. what really let me pull back the curtain and be like, Oh, wait a minute. Every great book starts as a pile of garbage, you know? And so like, it was really important for me to read all these, you know, outlines. Cause with work for hire stuff, of course, people submit an out, you know, they submit a pitch and then you do an outline and it's this whole back and forth, um, before they ever get to write the novel. And, no, I am not saying that outlines or pitches were a pile of garbage. Um, you know, I worked with some very talented authors, but it was just I had spent my entire life intimidated by that that idea that when you see a book, it's like 
you see a statue uh, that's like perfect and completed and it's up on this pedestal and you feel like, well, I could never make that. And the answer is like, well, they didn't make that either. You know, first, like they roughed it into shape, et cetera. And I think with music, because I came up through punk and hardcore and all those things, there was a lot more of a sense of like, if you can play three chords, you can write a song. Um, And so it was much more accessible to me early on. You know, like I, I booked my first gig, like my first show before I owned instruments or knew how to play them. Right. Like, you know, we're, <laughs> we were 15 and trying to get out of a class project. Um, and the the cool science teacher was like, why don't you put on a benefit concert? You guys have a band. Right. And it was like and at that point, our band consisted of like some dudes sitting around eating salsa, talking about how it would be cool to have a band. But then like that was that was the thing where it's like, I'll book the show and then we'll have three months to buy instruments and learn how to play them. And we did. And like that was fine. But so from the very beginning playing music for me was always about creation and expression and just like, just throw it out there. Like it doesn't need to be this big intimidating process. And I feel like when I can tap into that aesthetic um, or that ethic, when I'm writing, that's when writing is fun and easy. And when I can kind of get out of my own way and just be like, look, this, let's just do something that's cool. Like, let's not worry about if this is great art you know, it's very easy. I'm a sucker for writing advice books. Like I love reading writing advice and uh, it's very easy to overthink everything and to be like, all right, well, I need to keep, you know, all of these arcs and the seven point plot structure in mind and like, what's everybody's challenge and what do they desire in the scene? And what's everybody's flaw, you know, and you can fill your head up so much with that stuff that it stops being fun really quick. And I feel like in some ways, the fact that music for me has always just been like, I don't know, let's mess around and see if we make some cool noises and then like see if we can replicate those cool noises. It's much more like collage, I feel like for me. Um, and, and this is something I've been thinking about recently, which is that I think at some level, all art is found art, at least for me. You know, like somebody who makes a sculpture out of a bunch of things they find on the side of the road. That's how I make music, right? Like I sit there and I noodle around on a guitar until some little riff pops out and then I just find other things and attach them together. And I don't really worry about where that riff is going to come from that, like that initial seed pearl. And I think that when I can do that with writing, the writing is better as well. Like if you get too, if you become too much of an architect, I think the joy can uh, drain away, at least for me. I I definitely ran into that with kind of the first couple of drafts of the, uh, of my next book um, where I just, I wrote an absolutely dynamite uh, partial. It was like 60,000 words. And I had kind of designed a pretty cool world. And I was able to sell it for a really good contract. And then once I started writing the book, I found that I was becoming so obsessed with kind of the strictures the, the uh, that I grew up and I became an author learning that... I was just not having fun with it. And it was, yeah, it, it was the moment I, I became obsessed with this idea. Um, Cause I was writing this during lockdown too, uh, early on in COVID. And I became obsessed with this idea of, I have never really solidly outlined before. I have to, I'm going to change the way that I write and I'm going to start outlining like crazy. And I became obsessed with that. And each one, each of those first two iterations came out incredibly joyless. <laughs> and, and so it was uh, it was it was not until I kind of took a step back, took a deep breath and said, OK, I'm going to get back to that weird hybrid exploratory writing, but with a direction that I normally do. And I'm going to see if that works. And once I switched back to that, like it was so much easier. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like outlines really are important to me and that I have to know where I'm going. You know, I because I want to always be building toward whatever that end is. So it's important for me to know where I'm going, but to also leave room at the individual scene level or whatever you're doing um, to just have those flights of fantasy and those uh, the stream of consciousness moments like most of my best world building material back when I was primarily doing setting design, it would always come from the spitball stream of consciousness when I get out of my own way and I'm just putting things down because I have to put things down. It's it's improvisation, right? Yeah. And so I, you know, so many times the details that people really fixated on that ended up becoming big deals in like the Pathfinder setting 
are things that I was just throwing out there because I had 300 words to fill and I had an hour to do it. Yeah. You know, um, and I think that there's a joy to that, uh, that jam aesthetic of just in the moment, you know, you spitball and you're like, well, um, let's see, I need a city for this world. So I guess what if it's, uh, it's inside a giant snail shell on the bottom of the sea and it's filled with merfolk who have crab legs instead of eyes and they smell the water with their weird pincher eyeballs, you know, like and <laughs> just as you spin like that, I feel like you can come up with really interesting flavors Mm -hmm. that don't necessarily come out when I'm sitting there and going, okay, well, character A, we need to hit, you know, these seven beats of their arc. You know, I still I still think it's important to hit all those beats, but like you got to have the structure so that you can ignore the structure. Yeah. Um, kind of having, you know, and that, that's like a cliche almost is, is knowing all the rules so that you can know when to break them. Right. Right. Like I said, I love writing advice. So I'm full of cliches. you talked about the way you like to write uh music and yeah. i you know uh michelle and i watched the uh the beatles documentary a couple of weeks back oh yeah you were talking about that and and honestly it was it was very much like what you described but it also there was a kind of hopefulness that gave me because it made me realize that even though these were the most famous people in the world at their time um and even in in part still today uh these people did things that were quite similar to what I do as a you know, relatively small time epic fantasy author. Um, and it's kind of amazing to see that creative link there, you know, because, you know, one of the highlights of the entire eight hour series of this documentary is that we basically get to see the the song let it be from the beginning to the end right and it's incredible and it's just like you described where he's literally noodling and you as the watcher realize that it sounds vaguely like the song you know yeah and then he just noodles in the background for eight hours and you're you're kind of amazed by this whole process well and that was so funny when um I feel like there was a tweet going around with a little snippet of that. And I think it was them writing a uh, get back mm-hmm. or something um, where it's like everybody was marveling over, OK, this guy is playing this riff and everybody's like, oh, in three minutes, he goes from having nothing to having, you know, a hit single. And I watched it and I was like, that's cool. But that's just what writing music is like yeah. in my experience. Like, like, of course, it's extra special because it's the Beatles. But like that seemed like a very normal experience. And I realized that a lot of people who aren't don't have that background um, like this was this miraculous thing of you can just sit down and come up with something. And I think we we forget, right, like everybody's putting everyone up on pedestals. But I think that that's how all art is, right? You know, you just sit down and you mess around and something comes out that you kind of like and then you reshape it. And I think, uh, you know, one of my (laughs) one of my quests in life is to uh, teach classically trained musicians how to jam. (laughs) Um, because I know so many people who are so much better at their instruments than I am, Mm -hmm. but they were raised in, you know, orchestras or piano lessons or whatever. And so they have all this technical ability, but they don't believe they can play anything that isn't already written down on, you know, on sheet music. And I'm always aghast because it's like, come on, you have, you know, everything you need to know, just like play it. If you can play a scale, okay, now play those notes in random orders you're you're improvising you're jamming yeah and uh and i've had so much fun with people over the years when they go oh my god i can i can write music i can jam it's like yeah this isn't hard like everyone is an artist and so i think that there's a that that's really my philosophy with music and i think probably the more we can all apply that to writing and everything else uh the better yeah i've been trying to uh i've been trying lately to embrace um, and weirdly, I've been trying to embrace a little bit more of the weird because something yeah. I've kind of noticed over the last couple of years as I struggled with the new series 
uh, kind of getting that off the ground um, was that I spend a lot of time obsessing over both kind of the the rules of writing, like I mentioned before, but also over kind of my own rational 21st century mind. Mm. And and I like it's you really don't have to take a very big step into to over to like Lovecraft um, to realize that even somebody like me who's writing epic fantasy in a world that's around the 1800s as opposed to you know early medieval kind of epic fantasy which is more classic even stuff like that our own world around the 1800s was full of occult societies and weird beliefs and the most insane people doing insane things all the time yeah. and i've been trying really hard to embrace that because there's uh the like weirdly watching the wheel of time show which i know is a very dis divisive among wheel of time fans right watching the wheel of time show kind of visually helped me understand just how weird it gets um because i didn't really get how weird it gets from reading it you know it all felt very natural but it's full of very odd stuff it's got haunted cities and weird different opposing evils and you know strange things going on and i i'm trying to really remember that as kind of my roots of what i love about epic fantasy yeah um because i i feel like almost in the powder mage books i got too obsessed with keeping everything very realistic outside of the magic systems you know and right. and I, I i it's been a fun kind of journey to kind of realize that and and try to embrace it and i I feel like for me, that's really at the root of what I love about fantasy and science fiction is I want to be shown something new. I realize I actually like the thing that I get out of fantasy is the same thing I get out of travel or out of hiking. I always want to see what's over the next horizon. You know, I want I want some evocative image that pulls me towards that sense of discovery. And I think that's why I often get really tired of even and I realize I may come across as a hypocrite as somebody who has spent most of my career working in Dungeons and Dragons and like very, uh, very traditional RPGs. But like, I want the thing that I haven't seen before, because that's what we came to fantasy for. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and at this point, I've seen Tolkien. I've seen, you know, the standard uh, epic fantasy tropes. Like, I want to see something that kind of breaks my brain, you know, and I can remember uh, really the thing, probably the thing that hit a lot of people. Um, but I remember being in my early 20s and reading Perdido Street Station for the first time. And, you know, whether you love or hate the book, it's got to be acknowledged that it was very different than a lot of what was the mainstream fantasy at the time. You know, you, you're in there. And I remember having that reaction of, you know, turning a page and being like, cactus people seriously and then by the end of the book you're like hell yeah cactus people you know and it's like this woman's got a bug head okay great let's do it you know um and i feel like that really opened my eyes to the idea that as long as your world is consistent enough that the reader can can navigate it yeah um you can be totally bizarre and you can show them things that they've never seen before and that's what i want out of my fantasy you know i really don't I don't I don't really go into the historical accuracy because if I wanted that I would read historical fiction. Yeah, and I I think I got a little obsessed with it. I I've been really enjoying lately uh even just the last couple of days I've gotten a little bit on, on a Miyazaki kick. And Miyazaki's oh, a funny one because so many people love his stuff and I wasn't introduced to any of it until I was I think 22 or 23 right and and i watched and i remember watching uh very early in our marriage we uh we watched spirited away my wife and i she showed it to me because she loved it and i remember the first 10 minutes like i i just kept thinking this is the stupidest thing i've ever seen oh interesting i'm i am annoyed with this <laughs> and but then there was a moment at which it just charmed the hell out of me. Uh, like it was just clicked over. And But then I never really sought out any other Miyazaki stuff. I ended up loving Spirited Away. I think we also watched um, we watched Princess Mononoke. And, and there was a few others that we watched. And I, I enjoyed them fine, but I didn't really seek them out. And the last few days I've been watching them on uh, HBO Max because they've got the whole collection, the Ghibli collection. Yeah. And... And I, I've been thinking about it a lot. And I'm I'm like, man, I wish like we're watching, I think it was Castle in the Sky last night. 
And it was like, it was made, it came out the year I was born and I've never seen it before. And it, it blows my mind that like, I just missed that part of maybe not childhood because it was probably harder to get, you know, in the nineties um in the u.s you know for a you know small town midwestern kid like me but man it, it does feel like this gaping hole in kind of my uh exposure to ideas and visualized uh kind of fantasy right well and i think the the real appeal to me in a lot of these fantasy things is it's sort of the um the allure of the unexplained like the power of illusion like what makes star wars great in my mind is not really necessarily like you know Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader, et cetera. It's the Moss Eisley Cantina, right? It's that you look in there and you see 20 different alien designs that you may never see again. And the implication there is that there's this much wider universe that you don't get to know about. Mm -hmm. And I love that in, uh, you know, in fantasy and science fiction, I feel like cyberpunk actually often does this well, where they'll drop in terms that, you know, terminology that you can kind of, interpret from context, but they don't necessarily tell you what it means, right? Or in fantasy, when you're reading something and somebody mentions like, oh, you know, the the lost city of Zhangpo, you know, on the, the dinosaur continent of whatever, you know, and it never addresses it again. That's what captures my imagination is that feel that there is world beyond the backdrop that's being painted for the existing story. And it adds depth. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think especially in kind of my little genre in epic fantasy that that is uh, like that's that's kind of a key to becoming massively uh, successful with your world is yeah I mean it has to be well written the story has to catch and everything but the world itself has to feel like it's incredibly deep yeah and that doesn't have to be like I mean all respect to the authors and you may be one of them uh, who figures out like all the trade routes and like, what is the monetary policy of these countries and how do they affect each other? Like if that's your jam, great. But uh, I feel like you don't necessarily need to go that deep for me. You just have to throw in a bunch of cool, flashy, flavorful bits. You know, I want, Mm -hmm. I want all those jelly beans uh, that are just sort of left there. Um, so that in passing, I can get that brief shock of remember, like the world is large and mysterious. Yeah. Yeah. And that large and mysterious, I think, I think writing in the time period that I write in, uh, you know, the analog, you know, the real world analog, uh, time period that I write in, I think that's something I've lost out on a lot. Mm. And I, you know, kind of the big mysterious world. And I, I've been trying to kind of, you know, like I've, I said, to kind of reach back and, and figure out what was weird and mysterious during our own early 1800s. Yeah, because we sure didn't have everything figured out. Yeah, and and I think I think that's something that's I, uh, maybe easy to lose. Maybe that's just me, but I think it's something that's easy to kind of lose out on when you get hyper focused on you know creating a setting because it's not just what you put in; it's also what you leave out. Yeah. Yeah. And the questions that you ask, like the, one of the things that I always try to teach in about setting design is that like when I'm teaching, you know, about uh, folks who want to be GMs or whatever, it's really about the questions. And when you answer the questions, uh, you have to ask more. And that's sort of a cliche, but so often you'll have these fans who are desperate to know the answer to a big mystery in the setting. And then the second they do, it's over. Like, it doesn't matter how cool the answer is. Mm -hmm. The fun was in the theorizing and the wondering. And so I think it's really important to have questions that you never answer in your setting. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that always, that always kind of happens. Like people, people hate on lost uh, a lot of the time because, Oh, well, it, asked a bunch of questions that it didn't have answers to. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm a weirdo, but I really enjoyed Lost and I just never watched the last couple of seasons. And for me, like, that's fine. If if I get a show like Lost or Battlestar Galactica where everybody says, oh, the first couple of seasons are super good and mysterious and then you never finish uh, or then they never really answer it at the end or they answer it poorly. Yeah. I I go great and I just stop watching and then the series just exists for me with all of those questions and that feels good in a way that like a lot of my friends are like that is the worst most uncomfortable art that there is is like <laughs> you told me there was an answer and then you didn't tell me the answer and like I sometimes I get really frustrated by that if I think that there's you know if I'm spent if I spend you know hours and days reading a series to get the answer 
and then they never give me the answer. Like, okay, that sucks. But if they're just little background questions, I like not knowing the answer. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's a it's kind of a relatively common TV trope to kind of promise the big reveal and then never do it. Mm. Um, And I'll be honest, it drives me nuts as well. Right. You know, like uh, Battlestar Galactica is a good example that they did do the reveal and it kind of it felt so like like that they were scrambling, right? That that this wasn't something they'd actually planned from the beginning. They just realized they told us they'd plan it from the beginning right? around, you know, season, whatever. Um, And then they realized, Oh, we've got to give an answer here. It's here's the answer. And it's not great. But like, uh, like the show, the blacklist, I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, but I I watched the first couple of uh, seasons when it started coming out. And uh, because I love uh, James Spader, he's like the best actor for chewing on scenery ever. <laughs> and I, I realized at some point that all the big questions they were as- asking in that series were questions that they could not answer because if they answered them, people would lose interest. And so like every so often, every year or two, I will check back in on like the blacklist wiki- Wikipedias <laughs> just to know, just to see if they've ever answered these questions And it's always like, oh, they answered the question, but then they took it back immediately two episodes later. And like, it's like, Mm. uh, it's, it's the most horrible tease. I think maybe for me, maybe a lot of it comes from the fact that I have grown up writing for role-playing games where the whole idea behind role-playing games is that you're giving someone the tools to tell their own story. And so for me, you know, I try to, when I'm writing a, you know, a setting document, it's like every paragraph I'm trying to put in a mystery or a hook or something that someone could hinge a whole series off of um, and then leaving it unanswered because that's the value that I am providing to the gaming group is, hey, here's this thing that you will get to answer um, that will that will spark your creativity because an answer doesn't really spark creativity. If I tell you, you know, what killed the blood king of, you know, this whatever emper- uh, nation, that is not nearly as interesting uh, for you as a storyteller as, okay, you know, there's this mystery and there's all these questions about who killed the blood king and like th- suggestions that his soul was, you know, caught halfway between heaven and hell and imprisoned in this diamond or whatever, you know, like all of that. And this, this is how I work, by the way. It's always yeah. just a stream of bullshit. Um, <laughs> um, and I think that that, uh, that fundamentally gives people a lot more tools to work with mm-hmm. than if they know the answer from the beginning. Yeah, that's interesting. I, um, man, uh, RPGs are an interesting one for me because especially like, uh, like tabletop RPGs, m- my kind of my goal it, in and, and I I didn't I played them when I was young and then I've played them recently I did not play them at all during my like twenties yeah but my goal for a tabletop RPG has always been to hang out and goof off with my friends yeah I am never interested in developing my character or having a character arc or you know I do like the mysteries like the little breadcrumb mysteries those are fun to follow but it's all just a structure for goofing off with my friends. Yeah. And so I'm I'm always fascinated when I talk to people who get very much into like the role playing aspect of of I want to create a character who is going to go on adventures but also have massive changes and learn things about themselves and all that and I'm I'm kind of over here thinking I really just want to goof off. Like that's all I'm here for. And to tell you the truth, I'm the same type. I'm the same type of gamer which uh you know, <laughs> can be a blessing or a curse for the fans interacting with me or my stuff. Right. Um, yeah. you know, it's like for instance, it's often interesting at, uh, conventions if I'm running games or something, because I don't really care about the rules and I'm sure somebody somewhere who's familiar with my work is like, yeah, we know, <laughs> um, but <laughs> we can tell. Um, but no, I like, to me, it's always about the experience first. And so I like to laugh with my friends. I like to encourage, you know, it, I love playing horror games and stuff like that, too. You know, I, there's a place for darkness, but I don't know. I think that it should be a free form sort of like improv comedy thing for my games. Um, and there are other people that, you know, it is mm-hmm. if somebody's not going to write a novel, maybe 
the role playing games are where they get to explore like developing a character and, you know, creating an arc. And I think that's super cool. And people who want to play that way, you know, I've met so many people that are like, we've been playing the same characters in the same campaign for 20 years. And, you know, I can't imagine that I've never run a game longer than, you know, a year and a half. Yeah. And so it's just a very different experience, but that's the joy of RPGs is you can do them for anything. If you want to run a crazy goblin game where everybody's setting things on fire and running around, like that's my jam, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And everybody, everybody wants to get something different out of it. And it can be difficult kind of exploring that, especially with like new, a new group with who, who isn't, who, who don't necessarily all agree on what they want out of it. Um, and that kind of comes back to almost collaborative storytelling and, and what, I, I, man, there's so much, there's so many threads that I kind of love pulling at, uh, but that, um, especially with somebody like you who designs game, who has designed games for a living, yeah. but it's, I don't know, people, it's that, that expectations, managing expectations and, and teaming up to all do something collaboratively, but all having different expectations, what, what you're going to get out of it. Uh, like that's gotta be difficult to design for. Oh yeah. Well, and I think one of the traps that people run into is feeling like they need to, you know, whether it's designing a game or running a home game, they need to sort of please everyone and meet all expectations and plan for every eventuality without communicating. Mm -hmm. Like people expect the system to be responsible for their, their fun. And so I think that that's often kind of a big mistake, you know, and I understand that when you when you're operating at scale with an organized play program where people at conventions all over the country are playing with complete strangers like, OK, I get it that like if the rule system isn't pretty tight, you're going to have that one dude at the table who wrecks everybody else's fun. And I yeah. understand designing to try and minimize that. But I think that if you focus too much on that, you can end up with these very rules heavy litigious systems that just kind of forget that you can you can just say hey everybody we're here to have fun together you know so if you're doing something that makes people not have fun please stop you know and <laughs> i've i've had games like especially because you know i play with a lot of professional game industry people so like there was one game uh, a campaign i ran where i was playing with a guy who like he's on the magic pro tour he's you know, smarter than I will ever be when it comes to, you know, logic and system exploits and things like that. And so, of course, his characters were just massively overpowered because he enjoyed finding all of the little rules hacks. And I'm not a particular power gamer. And so once it became clear that he was, uh, you know, overpowering everybody else in the group, I just took him aside and was like, hey, man, like, yeah, you you solved the puzzle and that's great. But also you can see like these are your friends and they're not having fun. So can you work with me to figure out how to not make your character so overpowered? And as soon as it was presented like that, he was like, oh, yeah, totally. You know, and he found some fun ways to, you know, nerf his character um, in a like fun storytelling kind of way or just not make everything so optimized. And I think that that's so many problems in our society uh, stem from trying to rely on like a codified series of laws for every situation rather than communicating and holding <laughs> each other's needs like in regard. So, and that can be hard, you know, especially coming out of the tradition of Dundas of Dragons, which is very much a simulationist kind of thing where it's like people get into this mindset that every situation can be modeled by the rules set. Mm -hmm. And I'm much more like, you know, how about we're just here to have fun and tell a story. And when in doubt, you know, if the rules seem wrong, change the rules. Like I already sold you the book. I don't care what you do with it, right? Like throw it all out, you know, burn it. As long as you're having fun, that's what matters. And so if the rules are getting in the way of the fun, ditch the rules, change them. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people are unwilling to do that because that, that then puts kind of responsibility on them to to make the fun. Yeah. Well, and and I get it if you're like, I paid for a, a well-designed rule system, right? Like if you buy a video game and the physics engine keeps breaking <laughs> and, the, and the developer is like, well, just use your imagination. Like I'd be pissed <laughs> too. But uh, I feel like the deal with storytelling games is that ultimately – it's a set of guidelines to help you have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And so anything you can do to improve your experience is, is correct. Yeah, that's, that's a, I think that's a pretty healthy way of looking at it. 
Well, I so I'd like to finish these all up uh, by asking a very important question. Of course. Which is, what's the last thing that you ate that blew your mind? Okay, so I was thinking about this one but since I'm a huge fan of the podcast. <laughs> and uh, so I've been in lockdown for more or less for the last couple of years because uh, folks who follow my Twitter may know um, like uh, my wife is extremely high risk um, due to her being disabled. And so we've been locked down hard. And so the thing that really blew my mind was over the summer when cases were kind of low, uh, I had bought my friend Carlos a book on pizza making for Christmas, um, which was very much a self-serving gift. <laughs> And uh, he had gotten a backyard pizza oven. And so he offered to make me pizza, you know, out of this book. And I went over and it was, I kid you not, the best pizza I have Ooh. ever had. And never mind that I also had not eaten in a restaurant for like 18 months, but it just was that perfect, like Neapolitan, but like chewy. But like, you know, I feel like a lot of times the uh, the Neapolitan pizza gets really like floppy and like the grease soaks through in like two seconds. Yeah. And this didn't do that. It was just the perfect combination of like halfway between New York and Neapolitan. And it was magical. Ah, uh, that sounds great. A pizza oven is one of those things that I feel like it's so incredibly unnecessary, but I would so love one. <laughs> uh, counterpoint, I think it's incredibly necessary. It's food related. <laughs> I think you can make so many things, although I know that you're uh I don't know how well it works for uh, the deep dish that you are constantly extolling. Oh, I do love deep dish. I actually ha realized as you were talking that I have not made pizza at home for a good eight or nine months now. Whoa. Um, and I, I, I may need to get my deep dish recipe out and, and give it a whirl maybe next weekend. I think you need to. That is like a personal uh, deprivation. Yeah. Oh, man, I do love. It's weird because I, I remember being younger and really wanting to make my own pizza. But there was, a, you know, like attempting to do that when you are very, very poor and you realize <laughs> that making a good pizza requires like six dollars worth of cheese and it requires like four dollars of pepperoni. And making a pizza is actually a lot of times more expensive than ordering one. And so like I, I would always try and then I'd get discouraged because it costs too much money. And then there was a point at which my success started to be like, oh, I can actually spend a little bit of money on on food. Like, I don't yeah. have to budget everything. And oh, realizing that I can make for $20, I can make a pizza that's better than most of the pizza that I could possibly order. Oh, it's such a nice feeling. Yeah, I feel like I mean, that's kind of the story of food in America, right? Where like everything... We, we all want everybody to eat healthy, but of course, the healthy options and the make it yourself options are more expensive than the things you can buy mass produced. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I would say my pizza is uh, I have not reached the level where I am better than the restaurants I could go to. But uh, but you know what? Carlos is. So I'll just <laughs> going over to his backyard. And that's what matters. That was game designer and author James L. Sutter. Thanks again to James for taking the time to chat. You can find links to his social media and some of his books down in the show notes. You can find me, as always, at brianmcclellan.com. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. You can also get signed copies of my books direct from my website or swag from my Redbubble store. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. Huge thanks to Kyle Anderson, Patrick Hunt, Elijah, Glenn with an extra N, and Jennifer and Angela Johnson for their backing on Patreon. <laughs>